So if we look at this example here, we have a device, in this case a local area network or a LAN adapter, and our CPU. Well, the CP, or the, if the uh, LAN card rather wants to raise the attention or grab the, the attention of the processor, it would raise the voltage on one of the lines and basically say, hey you, I need your attention. The CPU would then communicate back via the I.O. address and communicate back to the to the actual uh, adapter. Now, now that's an oversimplified process of what's happening. There's actually uh, kind of an older way of, that that took place and a newer way. In the old way, the actual uh, voltage would be raised directly on that line. Each of the the small attachments that are inside of the expansion card has a trace or an electrical um, wire attached to it, and we could raise the voltage on that, and it would basically go into what was referred to as a pro uh, programmable interrupt controller. And this is on the older PCs. This PIC, and specifically it was referred to as an 8259A PIC controller, it would process the, uh, the interrupts from various devices and then basically shoot that over to the CPU and say, hey, so-and-so needs your attention. Now, on the older PIC uh, processors, the pro uh, programmable interrupt controllers, there were actually 16 different interrupt requests, 0 through 15. And those interrupt requests are assigned, or some are assigned, to specific devices. Okay, now with modern PCs, it's a very similar process, except now we have something referred to as the input-output advanced programmable interrupt controller, so the IO APIC. Now what this does is it allows, again, voltage will be raised, or the, the network adapter, or whatever the peripheral device is, it needs attention of the CPU, so it actually then passes that to the APIC. The APIC would then interrupt the CPU. The CPU would then query the, the IO APIC and say, who needs attention? And of course, the APIC would, would let the, uh, the CPU CPU know which exact device needs that attention. So the CPU doesn't necessarily have to know what what interrupts are assigned to what device or what's happening behind the scenes. All it needs to know is the fact that the APIC is handling it. So it queries the APIC and it passes that information on. So with an APIC system we have IRQs that are assigned 0 through 23. So we have actually 24 IRQs. So you can look in Device Manager and see how many IRQs do you have in your system. If you have 0 through 15, you have a PIC controller. If you have 0 through 24, then you have an APIC. That doesn't necessarily mean one's better than the other. APICs are obviously more modern. But if you have a PIC controller, it will still function. You can still do all the things that you need to do. It's just that it's an older technology. Okay, now if we touch on that older technology for just a moment, uh, I want to just point something out to you. With the advent of the original IBM XT, we had IRQs 0 through 7. When we added the AT, or evolved into the AT, we then added 8 through 15. So that gave us our total of 16 IRQs. The original XT slot, if you recall, fit cards that were designed, that were 8-bit ISA cards. When we basically then added that second set of IRQs, we made the slot backwards compatible. So cards that were that were designed for the XT could fit into a 16-bit ISA. They would just plug into the first section here. Well, in order to make that backwards compatible, we needed to make a way to connect these two electronically. So IRQ2 basically cascaded to IRQ9, because this was 0 through 7. This was 8 through 15. So the decision was made to have IRQ2 electronically connect to IRQ9. The IRQs were assigned a priority. Originally, with the XT, it was just numerical, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So if two cards were to try to gain attention of the processor at the same time, the card with the higher priority would win. Well, now since we're cascading here, that kind of throws a little bit of a monkey wrench in the works. So you'll see here, we have 1, 2, but then 2 actually cascades, as you see, down to the second set. So this second set would actually take priority. So it goes 1, 2, then 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. And then it jumps back up to the rest of the IRQs on the first set, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So just something to keep in mind. All right, and then this chart just gives you an idea of what IRQs are assigned. Okay, we have some that are standard uh, that are assigned to certain peripherals. 
IRQ0, uh, as example, is the system timer. IRQ1 would be the keyboard. IRQ3 uh, and 4 are assigned to our COM ports, and so on and so forth. So if we look at the second set here, we see we have IRQs 8 through 15, and there's a number of ones that are open. That was for expandability. So if you plugged in another expansion card into your bus, whether it be a network adapter or a video card or a modem or what have you, those uh, open IRQs or those IRQs that are not assigned could be assigned to that card. Okay, so the next item I want to talk about in our discussion of system resources is DMA, or direct memory access. So as the name implies, direct memory access is the method or the process of directly accessing memory. And the reason you want to do this is because you don't want to involve the central processing unit or the CPU for certain mundane tasks. In other words, the CPU without a DMA process would have to get involved with absolutely everything that takes place within the computer, which all the comings and goings of everything. So in order to allow devices, let's say for instance uh, a network adapter, if it needed to access, just you know, to put it out there, let's say it needed to access memory for some reason. Well, if that were the case, it would have to contact the CPU first, go through that whole process, CPU would contact memory and vice versa, and it would act as the intermediary. That's interrupting the CPU from doing uh, its tasks, crunching numbers, processing, and so on and so forth. So a lot of these things were taken out of the equation, and we have a DMA controller also known as an 8237 chip, just like the older, or the IRQ, the PIC processor we talked about was an 8259, this was assigned the number 8237. So the DMA controller would then allow the, the peripheral to contact it directly, and it would handle the request, and it would take the CPU out of the equation. So we would take this away, CPU wouldn't have to be bothered with those little tasks, and life could carry on. Now again, with the IBM XT, we had DMA channels 0 through 3, and with the AT, we added an additional set. We had 4 through 7 for a total of 8. In a modern PC, really the only thing that actually uses DMA anymore is our floppy, dri floppy drives. That still uses DMA really the only thing left because DMA in, in, in this form is very slow only supports 16-bit transfers and there's just more efficient ways of doing that so in a modern computer we have such things called ultra DMA or UDMA okay hard hard disks typically will use ultra DMA or UDMA and the difference is we don't have to actually go through a DMA controller so if we don't have to go through a DMA controller, that's referred to as a bus mastering device. As an example here, I have a UDMA hard disk and memory. So we have a direct access to memory, but we're not going through a direct memory access controller. So bus mastering devices have circuitry built into them that allow them to take control of that external data bus, but also understand or monitor to make sure that nobody else is trying to communicate on that data bus as well. If they were, then they have the ability to pull themselves off or basically stand back and allow that communication to take place. Or if the CPU, as an example, wanted to put information um, out on the data bus. So we have the CPU here, and it wants to put information out or do whatever, communicate with another device on that bus. The bus mastering device is able to pull itself back. So it allows, again, information or um, exchange of information between the peripheral and memory without involving the CPU unless it's necessary. Not involving the CPU for every little thing that needs to take place allows that central processing unit to uh, pay more attention and to concentrate on the things that it needs to do most efficiently, crunching numbers, processing, so on and so forth. Okay, the last of the four items of our system resources is memory. Now, as far as memory is concerned, there are two instances where this comes into play. Let's say for instance we have an adapter card that has its own RAM. Let's say for instance we have a video card 